Hey guys, this is Gina Gleason from Baroness, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. 200 episodes of the new scene. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. And we've got a jam-packed show for you. We have George Clark of Deaf Heaven. Deaf Heaven exploded onto the scene in 2013 with the release of their now classic LP, Sunbather. And this conversation covers everything. We cover George's intro to heavy music, some of his background. We do a little deep dive on each of the records. We cover the release of Sunbather, the 10-year anniversary, everything. It's a fantastic conversation, and that's coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Follow us on Twitch at The New Scene. Shirts. We have shirts for sale at our store at Death Wish Inc. We've got a long sleeve option. We've got a bunch of short sleeve options. Pick up a shirt. It's a great way to support the show. Reviews. Give us five star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I am on the push to get us over 200 reviews on both Apple and Spotify. Now, at Spotify, we sit at 195. We're good there. We're going to close the gap soon. But on Apple, we are at 140. So we've got a long way to go. And listen, 52% of our audience listens on Apple Podcasts. So it's time to open up that podcast app, search the new scene, and hit that five-star button. Do it. Do it. It'll help me out. And why wouldn't you want to do that? Also, you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Dead Bars, Regulars, LP. The second pressing is out right now. The Seattle Punk Quartet's latest record was produced by Jack Andino, and he worked with Nirvana, Soundgarden, Mudhoney, and more. You gotta hear that. You gotta get that. The One Line Drawing UK tour is underway. Check the Iodine Instagram or the One Line Drawing Instagram for a full list of tour dates. Stretch Armstrong Tour merch leftovers are available now at the Iodine store over at Death Wish Inc. There's limited quantities, so get it fast. And Horse Whip Consume and Burn LP is out this Friday. Pre-order it, buy some merch, listen to the record. You gotta check it out. I'm really looking forward to that one. It's gonna be awesome. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor they've sponsored us before they'll probably sponsor us again say hello to bridge nine records that's right bridge nine records is back to sponsor the new scene for the month of november and here's some updates for you pre-orders are up for new incendiary device shirts grab one while they're still available they're going to go fast. Death Before Dishonor have tour dates with Slapshot in Europe in 2024, and they've added some additional tour dates beyond those. It's all happening in 2024. Check out the Bridge9 Instagram or the Death Before Dishonor Instagram for a full list of dates. And listen, you've got to stop by the Bridge9 Record Store at 282 Rantoul Street in Beverly, Massachusetts. It's open every Wednesday through Sunday, starting at 11 a.m. And have you seen what's going on over there? They had American Nightmare play over there. They had Cave-In play over there. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. And when you go to the record store, you may even see Chris Wren himself working the register. And when you go there, you can ask him, Chris, what's your favorite independent music podcast in the world? And I'm sure, at least for the month of November, he's going to say the new scene. For more information, head to bridge9.com 
And make sure you follow Bridge9 on Instagram at Bridge9. That's Bridge N-I-N-E. Okay. So listen, make sure you check back in with me after the interview with George. There's a lot of fanfare. We're celebrating 200 episodes of the new scene. We'll do the community hour. I've got Q&A responses. I've got emails from listeners. I've got different messages from different people. We'll talk about the show. We'll do a little retrospective. We'll do some music recommendations. We'll cover everything. But right now, we are going to speak to George Clark of Death Heaven. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with George Clark. George, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Yes, George, it's great to have you here. You know, there's a lot going on with you. We've got the Deaf Heaven Sunbather 10-year anniversary. That's very exciting. You just got off a massive tour with Coheed and Cambria. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, and we're going to cover all of that, George. But first, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? Today, I am well. Yes. Um, we are having a bit of good weather here in New York the last couple days after uh, some rain. I've been uh, outside mostly. It's been good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. There's uh, there's a lot of good things happening. You know, new music, great conversations. This is my favorite time of year. I, I've got nothing to complain about right now. I'm glad to hear it. Yes. Where in New York are you? I'm in Flatbush in Brooklyn. Ah, I'm in Williamsburg. Oh, nice. Yes. Where? Uh, when did you move here? Um, about two years ago. How do you like it so far? I like it quite a bit. Yeah, I've uh, I've enjoyed my time uh, when I am here uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's the best. You know what? I've been here eleven years now, and uh, I'm still not sick of it. When I'm away, I look forward to coming home. When I'm in Manhattan and I have to go do something in there, I still walk around and look up at buildings and I'm like, I can't believe I live here. I'm the exact same way. I think there's a, um, especially coming off tour, I think New York really facilitates uh, the mental switch. Um, you're kind of thrown into it and it's it's positive for me, definitely. That's awesome. That's awesome. So how did the tour with Coheed go? That's a massive tour. Yeah, uh, the tour was great. We did um, two legs, uh, one in the spring and, and one in the fall, about 10 weeks altogether. And, uh, you know, I, can, I honestly, I can't say enough good things. Um, both the band and their crew uh, were very hospitable and um, very cool the whole time. And, and you know, um, we don't often support uh, bands, especially for this length of time, just for whatever reason. Um, so to have this uh, be uh, the first time that we've done it in a while um, and, and have it be such a positive experience was really nice. Right. I mean, if it's Coheed, we have to, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and we had, um, you know, it's it's been actually like a couple, actually more than a couple of years um, that we've sort of been in their purview and, uh, and tried to make things happen. And, um, and I'm glad that we were finally able to. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, where did you grow up as uh, San Francisco? No, no. Um, I grew up sort of all over California, but I'm from Florida. Um, Oh really? Where? Uh, Gainesville. Oh, ah, um, okay. But I've only really born there. My, um, my family is from Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, uh, but my parents in their uh, 20s moved out to California. They're still the only family we have there. Um, and then uh, in California, I lived in, um, I lived in L.A. Uh, I also lived in Merced and Bakersfield and Modesto. So largely the Central Valley. And then um, San Francisco is kind of the place that everyone in the Valley that wants to leave. Um, generally aspires to and and so when we were 19 uh we were able to make it to the city i'm curious about like your formative experience or experiences in music where did you come in what grabbed you was there a particular band or style that really hooked you into everything like for me you know once i discovered hardcore shows and everything happening in the late 90s and just you know, almost getting killed at shows. The thrill of it was 
just too much. And I, I dove in head first. Like what grabbed you? <laughs> yeah, uh, c- kind of the same. Um, I mean, like uh, my my mom is, uh, I guess, had me when she was younger. And so I took a lot of my early music influence and stuff from, from her. She was uh, quite into like 90s alternative um things like uh radiohead and nine inch nails and pearl jam and nirvana and and that kind of thing but she was also very into like the offspring and so i i I, those were cds that i listened to quite young and then uh, as far as my own adventuring um yeah probably around 10 11 getting into uh new metal and kind of which was very popular on the radio at the time and and uh and actually getting into um getting into heavier music through that and then by middle school uh going to my first big concerts and then toward the end of middle school like summer after eighth grade going to my first like local show and and then kind of um starting to really experience things on on the ground level at like 13 but yeah my uh First big concert was um, it was God, it was f- funny to say it was a uh, Pantera and Slayer and and Morbid Angel and a friend of mine and I went we were like twelve years old and uh, his mom dropped us off and it was a very uh, very big deal for us I, I we lied and said it was something I, I'm afraid that she would look up Slayer uh, <laughs> yeah and then and then yeah kind of like yourself um, the the most of what especially the suburbs offer um are hardcore shows or um at that time uh metalcore and hardcore so yeah from like a local perspective that's that's definitely how i got into music was was mostly through that style even though in my spare time my leisure time i i listened to mostly like bigger metal acts i guess so a good mix of things it sounds like uh, did you did you hold on to the bigger metal acts when you discovered hardcore like did you just keep listening to everything i did yeah you know honestly with with hardcore in in general it it took me a while um i I, a lot of my friends were were into punk i had um a couple friends that were into metal but most of who i hung out with were were punks and that's if you were alternative in, in the places that i grew up in that's generally what you gravitated toward um but uh, funny to say, the thing that always kind of drove me to heavier music when I was younger was um, was like a big like negativity and like and like kind of like um, real like scariness and uh, and I I when I was young I regarded punk and hardcore as a bit friendly and um, kind of community oriented in a way that like even though I was a part of and and inherently supported and um for some reason uh just didn't quite identify with um and so so yeah so i was listening to a lot of like black and death metal and stuff like that while while going to these while going to these shows but then eventually you know kind of matured and and uh and broadened my horizons and and found a lot of um punk and hardcore that that really lasted yeah, it's, I would get locked onto one thing and drop everything else because, I don't know, I was trying to be different or whatever was going on. But as the years progressed, I just uh, accumulate all of it and can appreciate all of it now. And yeah, that was a big appeal about hardcore when I discovered it, that you know, it was I was just rejected everywhere else and I found true community there. And uh, I've always been a big fan of like crossover bands doing that type of thing. The first show... I ever went to was Converge and Dillinger Escape Plan. And it was so insane. Like, how could I ever turn back from that? But I've always been more drawn to the uh, the crossover bands singing about like a wide variety of subjects and not just like necessarily New York hardcore, like, you know, surviving the streets type stuff. Yes, yes. And I, I think I, I was very much the same. And I think that, um, I think like you, that those bands... Uh, really helped open the doors to to other styles of hardcore and and especially earlier hardcore, eighties hardcore and stuff like that. Um, but like Con- Converge and and Dillinger, um, Converge especially were were huge for me. Uh, and fun- funny actually, we just played a festival with them um, 
I guess just last week. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, Nate's talking to my dad and my dad's telling him that, you know, I had like their poster in my bedroom and just this sort of very funny kind of almost awkward teenage full circle moment. But yeah, just, um, (laughs) amazing, amazing band, amazing, consistent band. Uh, yeah. I love that. Your, your dad actually talking to Nate from Converge. (laughs) Yeah, and having no idea, like you know, my dad, who who is a huge supporter of us, and therefore has um, has uh, gained some type of knowledge about our scene and stuff like that, still broadly doesn't really know these bands. Uh, so yeah, he he to hear him have this conversation, but not actually understand the full context of everything is is a. Uh, is endearing. <laughs> That's great. So he'll actually come out to festivals and shows and everything to see you guys. He is probably our biggest fan. I don't think anyone has seen us more. Um, yeah, uh, here and abroad. Yeah. Oh, he'll come abroad too. He will. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not all the time, but if it, uh, he's a he's like an avid runner. Um, so he will kind of plan and say we're um touring europe or something he'll if he can plan to do like the stockholm marathon and then we'll we'll see him uh kind of like that uh we're 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 probably secondary you know but yes he has seen us internationally uh a few times i love that i love that it's got to feel good to have a a parent so into what you're doing too right because i've been in bands over the years and Sometimes my parents aren't that into it, but sometimes they are. And it, it always feels good when they like it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I feel very lucky that um, that they both are um, big supporters of what we do. It must blow your dad's mind to see you like at these big festivals and these big crowds and everything, right? I mean, like you guys are really doing it. Yes, I, th- I think so. And I think... Um... I, th- I think for, for you know, I, I think when you're on the inside long enough, a, a lot of this can can lose its magic um but uh for him it 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 never you know it never lessens so it is it is nice to have him around it it does kind of remind you i guess that that what that what you do is um you know kind of unique and and interesting that's awesome so when did deaf heaven get started that got started around 2010 you and carrie the guitar player, right? Yeah, yeah. So 2010 was um, just the two of us uh, wanting to throw our hat in the ring, and and we made a demo. How old are you at that time? Uh, God, I was like 21. And were you both in uh, San Francisco? We were. Yeah, um, we had met in Modesto in in the Valley uh, when we were 14. Um, and then had lived together already in Modesto. We had an apartment together. And so this was kind of like the, the natural next step. I, I, uh, I ended up going up a few months before him and, and was able to kind of secure a living situation. And then he came up shortly after. Was it crazy expensive to live there even then? I know, uh, around 2000, let's say 13, 14, it was probably at its peak, but how did you manage to do it then? Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, it was insane. Well, here's the funny thing is, is, you know, now you look at it and it just seems unfathomable. And, and even if you think, and if you look at, or you have like a friend who's like, yeah, you know, in the Tenderloin at 2009, I was, you know, I was paying like $1,200 for my studio. And at the time, 1200 was just, it was just impossible. You know, I was like, yeah, $1,200 for like a, a room you know that's uh, <laughs> unreal so to compare the two now is is quite funny i'm sure it's like 2500 or, or more um in any case uh we what did we do uh well the first place we moved into we had uh there was 14 of us all together so we had 12 roommates um <laughs> and it was a old nunnery um in in the hate district and we shared a room uh, that was like the size of a closet and it had a makeshift loft built in it uh, with a little ladder to kind of create like a sleeping space. And we both slept there and we both had single mattresses just on top of the loft. And then each of us had a sleeping bag. And, and that was 
that was the first house. And then the second place we lived uh, was, it, we had a, our first bassist, um, our friend Derek. We moved in with him. We shared the living room. Carrie had the couch. I had the floor. And it was pretty grimy. Um, and then we just kind of continued like that. So I guess I, I slept on the floor or or like the, the mattress thing um, for like four years. Um, for like the first four years of the band, you know, give or take. Wow. And yeah, it, it just because I mean, and, and to be fair, in those four years, you know, we had picked up touring and stuff like that. So I was, I was gone um, quite a bit as well. But yeah, we just that's what we had to do. It was um, it was fun. Yeah. When you're young, it doesn't really matter. Uh, even when you're older, when I was 30, I was still living pretty grimy, you know, like I well, I just had a room with a bed in it, basically, and paid four hundred dollars a month which seemed like a lot at the time, but now, you know, yeah. you know things have ch- things have obviously changed. Yeah, it just wasn't the point, you know. Um, yeah. It wasn't like we just, that, that we were being given an opportunity to play the stuff that we make around the country and then eventually around the world was, um, I, didn't, I didn't need anything else, I guess. So when we're recording the demo, you, it was just you and Carrie that put it together, right? Yeah, uh, Carrie and I put it together. Um, Carrie mostly, definitely. I mean, he uh, he essentially wrote the entire thing, and then we had our friend John uh, come in and I think we did a couple practices, um, and and then he he tracked it with us uh, for for drums. Oh, okay. So just the three of you uh, did everything. Yes. Yes. Was it hard to find people to play with or did you like know enough people in the scene that it was easy? Because I, when I, I just, most of the time I find it difficult to find people or the right people to, to get things done, right? Because people are usually too busy or they're not good enough. You know, there's not a lot of people in that sweet middle spot. Yeah. Yeah. It's super hard. Um, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, we didn't know anyone. We weren't really in the scene uh at all um we went to shows and and we had a very small group of friends but we we were never like um known people i guess in in the scene so so actually so for our first real permanent drummer uh we found on craigslist and our first real guitar player uh, other than carrie was a friend from modesto who had his own projects and was just kind of willing to to do ours as well but was never like his main drive um it, it was it was sort of ramshackle um just yeah kind of a uh, scrap so what what it really would happen was we were getting show offers and we didn't have a band at all and we accepted the show offers because we thought maybe this would light a fire and so we scrambled and essentially did anything to find people that could play the songs and then through like more rigorous touring in subsequent years um we had you know like member changes and things like that because the commitments get harder and and um and lots more strain um occurs uh so yeah i would say like those first couple years yeah we we it was a bit of like a revolving cast um it wasn't really until sunbather or like after the record was finished and we were kind of prepping uh, that year of touring and stuff that we assembled what would become the first version of the permanent band by that point is it easier you can be like hey we've got this record on death wish we've got these things coming up come on yeah m- much easier um uh yeah definitely especially because people weren't really aware of how like grueling and grime on you know on the inside it was um <laughs> it, you know you have like a uh an ad in decibel you know and, and to someone that's maybe unfamiliar with how things work they you know they think you own your apartment or something uh <laughs> so so i think that there probably was um a bit of that um and and I think also Carrie at that point, because it had been a couple of years and he's always really been the one to handle the member situation. 
um, was just much better at, at vetting and understanding what was needed. And um, so when, when we found our guys, it, it felt really good. It, it really clicked. The demo comes together. That's how we get the attention of Deathwish, right? Yeah, yeah. We um, uh, we put uh, God. It's it's uh, interesting to say just because of everything that's happened. But we, yeah, we uploaded the demo to Bandcamp, which at the time was quite new and and exciting um, because Mediafire and Mega Upload had gone under and uh piracy was kind of at a low point and we all and we were all um you know like my music library was huge uh we yeah remember when you could just google band name media fire and get any record Dude, Those were, that was it was like the wild west it was oh, i just i i still have a laptop that's at <laughs> that's at my <laughs> parents house that has like just so many discographies, you know? Um, I remember the first time sh- someone showed me Spotify in like 2011, we were like up high, like listening to records all night. And they're like, how about this record? So I Google, you know, band name, media fire, download it. And they're like laughing at me. And I'm like, what are you laughing at me for? And they're like, just get Spotify. You can just put on anything. And I was like, Psh. I want to own it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And then, and then, you know, and then, like later, you're like, oh, they're all in it together. Like this was totally planned. Yeah, uh, yeah. It is funny because I know it's the same thing. I totally remember that change. And and along with that, um, it was Spotify and and SoundCloud and Bandcamp and and like for rap and like electronic music soundcloud was really kind of the thing and for Bandcamp was like guitar music seemed to be um what it was like orienting toward um and so we're like cool this is great so yeah we put it on Bandcamp, and um yes we got an email one day uh that was like a little receipt from Bandcamp saying that jake uh that jake had purchased it and um uh, we were like whoa <laughs> you know, like that's cool. like, like, dude. Like, in fact, I want to say, yeah. I don't know. I, I maybe like, I don't know. I called Carrie like immediately, um, and we were just yeah, pretty flabbergasted by the whole thing. I love that. I I still do that too. Like, if someone likes something or follows me that I don't expect, I'll like screenshot it, you know, and I'm like, hey, I got to capture this moment. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then they got in touch pretty shortly after I want to say, I remember. So I like I, every few years, uh, in my late teens and early twenties, my like life would fall apart, you know? And, um, <laughs> and during one of these periods, I was like, I gotta go to school. Uh, I gotta do something with myself. Um, so I enrolled in, community college and had been there maybe a month and um and i took a phone call with trey mccarthy at at death wish and we had this great convo and and they were interested in releasing the demo and i was like i was like we can do that for sure uh but we actually have all this new music and if you're willing to you know kind of take the risk or whatever that uh, we'd like to pursue something new with you. And, um, and he agreed. And, and that was our first record roads to Judah. And, and I stopped community college and, uh, and we hit the studio and, and we were on the road, you know, pretty shortly thereafter. Wow. Yeah. Roads to Judah. Some of the lyrical content I've read deals with, uh, a year of excess it describes that you had. So, uh, I, I mean, what's your relationship with drugs and alcohol? Did you struggle previously? Have you left all that behind? Like, what's your story in terms of that? Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, it, it is funny to call it struggle. Um, cause I suppose in the end, that's what it was though. It does take one kind of a long time to, uh, ascertain that. Um, Yes, I loved drinking and uh, and doing drugs from a pretty early age, uh, and 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 in my teens it it hiked up quite a bit, and uh, and that continued uh, in San Francisco, and 
Yeah, I used um, the fallout of a lot of uh, a lot of that behavior as um, lyrical inspiration. I, uh, you know, especially then um, when when the focus was uh, when the focus was was such so much on black metal and this idea of depressive black metal and and um, uh, and and suicidal black metal. We really wanted to kind of mine that and um and so i i used a lot of those kind of like i said i used a lot of that fallout from drinking and drugs to pursue um this really kind of like overwrought uh depressing lyricism um and i think that some of those themes uh continued throughout uh our records um and reflections on those themes still present themselves. Um, but yeah, it's been almost six years since, uh, since I've partied. Um, so it's, it's kind of behind me, you know, or not kind of, it very much is, but, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's kind of a big, you know, in my opinion, it's a big part of our story. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the only one. Um, and we, uh, we definitely kind of at one point dragged ourselves to hell and back. Uh, it was, it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> How did you stop? You know, like, did you, did you need a lot of help? Did you just throw yourself into working out or music? Like, how did you get past it? You know, it, it's something that you always know. I think, uh, at least in my case, I, I de- you know, it's in the back of your head, uh, at least the thought like you can't do this forever. Um, so while many things occurred that should have been catalysts to this decision, um, it just so happened that one day, honestly, uh, after a night out with friends, but not even a particularly hard night or anything, a, a real kind of casual four or five drinks or whatever. Um, I was just like, I, I really can't do this anymore. Um, it, it was, a a spiritual exhaustion, I guess. Um, and, um, thankfully, uh, I had friends who were doing some of the same things and, um, and at the same time, Deaf Heaven was, um, in the middle of writing our album, Ordinary Corrupt Human Love. Um, Mm -hmm. so I was going up to the Bay area quite a bit to, to work on that and being around those guys, um, and, and having something to do and being quite occupied, I think was very helpful. And then, and then lastly, yeah, um, fitness, uh, was very instrumental in, um, in giving me you know, in, in giving idle hands a task, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, because, uh, cause I, uh, I found that I'm, a, I've, I have quite a bit of energy. Um, I am, uh, you know, I even, even in, in a manic sort of sense. Um, and, and I need that energy expelled and, uh, and it's a great way to do that. And it, and it does, it helps alleviate the kind of anxieties that, um, I think one finds when they're looking to, you know, drink or, or do whatever. Right. No, and that's great. I, I feel a lot of connection there. I too put everything down six years ago and I went hard until I was 35. And, you know, on my last run, I just hit a point where I was like, I, I cannot do this anymore. I'm phys- physically and spiritually exhausted. So I tapped into all the resources that were there to stop and Ever since I stopped, I just picked up everything that I used to do that I love, bands, uh, video production, you know, this podcast came out of that, a lot of a lot of other stuff that I do. And I just constantly work. And I don't care if it's unhealthy or whatever. I just love to constantly be working on things and constantly be busy. And it brings me, you know, all the joy that I have nowadays. I love that. Yeah, it's 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 great to hear. And I do find that with um with with a lot of people uh like ourselves that is often a, a remedy um and um and and a, a pleasurable one um i've kind of found the same really just 
thing, things I was always into, but kind of new things as well. Uh, yeah. you know, being like, Oh wow. I really like, you know, this part of history. Uh, I'm going to buy over the next year, 30 books about it. <laughs> you know? and, <laughs> and, uh, and like, of course, you know, that in itself is its own little obsession, but it, it's, uh, it's nice that they can, uh, be a little, uh, diversified, I guess. Yeah. Isn't it so weird to be able to like set out to do something and then actually do it? Yes. It's, uh, it, yeah, it, it's nice. It's, it's nice to be, um, to be reliable, uh, both, both, um, from other people and, and from yourself. Uh, I, th- I think it's a, it's a great, a great gift. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can just kind of tackle all aspects of life. Like, you know, you're doing the band the whole time and the band is growing and the band is doing great, but I don't know, maybe you weren't getting much of else, much of anything else done. Like I would go to work my day job and it would be fine and I was doing okay and I didn't get fired, but I couldn't do phys- I could not do a single other thing except like go to work and then come home and get high. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I was, yeah, I mean, I mean, what, what am I going to say? Yeah, I was, I was, I was total outside the band, just a, yeah, pretty, pretty much a waste of a person. But, but yeah, like, you know, this is, this is likely untrue, but I will say it anyway. There, there is something to be said, I think about something, something to be said about how we, almost from like burying our heads so deeply in this sand were we able to persevere through like some wretched times do you know what yeah. i mean um like god god bless straight edge bands that do their first that do any first few years of touring you know like i mean we would sleep in you know, promoters closets on their shoes and stuff. (laughs) And which was totally fine if you're hammered, you know, and like we, you know, we'd be like, all right, you know, you reluctantly agree, but you're going to pass out hard anyway. Um, to, to not have the assist. Wow. My, my hat is truly off to, to those that have never needed it. Uh, wow, I never thought about that before. That's yeah. Cause when you're passed out, like I used to get on a plane in New York and then wake up in California. Like I would just be passed out the whole time. Absolutely. Like, how do these straight edge bands do it? Props to them. Yeah, uh, a lot of fortitude, no doubt. Yeah. So Sunbather, we know that this record came out on Death Wish in 2013, and we are now celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the record, which I can't believe because it still feels like I heard it yesterday. And this record was... Uh, I'm interested in your perspective on this. This record kicked off a lot of things like i know that bands like you existed before and i know people have mixed black metal with other types of music before but for me personally i had never really heard anything quite like this and i remember hearing dream house for the first time and i was just like this is unbelievable this is like everything like, oh, I'd, i've never uh i've never been a fan of black metal like i don't know a lot of the bands i don't listen to a lot of it you know it's just I'm not big in the metal world. I'm more hardcore, post-rock, emo, that world. But when I heard this song, it blew my mind. And I was like, this is everything I like. Uh, Aggressive riffs, post-rock parts. It's just, you know, it's just crazy. And then after that, other bands started popping up. I, you know, I discovered Glassing. I discovered Holy Fawn. I, I think, I think it really kicked off a lot of things. What do you think about that? I mean, I think that's great. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's cool and kind of surreal and um, odd, I guess, in a way. <laughs> you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you what's odd about it is is that is that I'm is that I don't feel like I was. We were I was 24 when we put the record out, um, mm-hmm. and and so I don't feel particularly like an elder statesman at this point. Um, I, I recognize that the band has been around for uh, enough time to be viewed that way by some, especially younger people. Um, but it is surreal for me who feels still like a scrappy upstart and still as someone who is striving uh, and is on the ascent and is goal making and wants to be where my idols are. It is, it is 
funny to and surreal to to see that we at least have entered some kind of middle period where young people who are in bands now um first heard sunbather when they were 13 or 14 years old who are doing their first tours now um uh and um who will soon become our contemporaries you know and um it's it's really fun and 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 ultimately it's a blessing you know to to be in this position but it is kind of funny it's like hey i'm i'm you know i'm still here too (laughs) like (laughs) we we kind of vowed that we like we really i'm i'm i want to say this first that um I'm really happy that we're doing this. I think the shows are going to be amazing. And, um, and the work that both death wish and Jack Shirley and, and Nick Steinhardt have all put into, um, this new anniversary, uh, edition is, um, is awesome. Um, but we are never really ones to look back. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, um, so uh, while, while we are celebrating this, it's, it's also kind of not where my head's at, you know, like we're working on a new album and I'm very excited about what's to come. Um, so it's just kind of fun. Yeah. I guess we're just sort of, I know this is like long winded and I'm not really getting to any point, but we're basically just like in this middle and, um, and it's interesting cause it, yeah, it's, um, it's not, we've never done it before. Never been here. No, I like that. And George, long answers are good. You know, if you were just like, it's great, I'd be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I tend to, to meander a little bit. But yeah, it's uh, if, 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 if people like what we do and, and, and take it into their own music, I think that's really flattering. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy that we're still here doing it alongside them. That's awesome. I think your attitude is perfect because... You know, if you were just like, yeah, we're the best, you know, we started all this and that and we're at the top of whatever, you might get comfortable and you might not work as hard and maybe the music wouldn't be as good. But it sounds like you're just really into what you're doing and focused on the future and focused on the next thing, which is where you want to be. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, I I think that that idea of being interested is just really paramount. Um I think that we we continue to be invested in ourselves in in a way that um that really drives the band a, as a whole, you know, not just creatively. Yeah, it was special because I, you know, it, I hadn't heard anything really like that before and I remember I always think of this one day, right? There was a Sunday in Brooklyn and my drug dealer would never answer the phone on Sundays. But for some reason, he answered the phone, and I got some some things, and I listened to, I got high, and I listened to Dreamhouse 16 times in a row. And, <laughs> and that's a really long song, but that, I, always, I always think of that day when I think of that song, and I'm like, hell yeah, that, that was a good day. Man, that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to think about that day. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that we could have had, you know, I'm glad we had that moment together. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cool. I, I want to say. Hey everybody, Keith here to remind you that the Deaf Heaven Sunbather 10 year anniversary edition is in stores worldwide on November 17th. It's remixed and remastered by Jack Shirley and available in spatial audio. There's updated vinyl, CD, and cassette packaging by the album's original designer, Nick Steinhardt. Catch the band on their Sunbather Anniversary Tour. It starts November 26th, and it features Touche Amore. Pre-order the album and buy tickets now at deafheaven.com. I want to say when Dreamhouse came out, we were in Oslo. Um and had maybe just finished playing a show or I mean, we were backstage and seeing like it on pitchfork or something and being totally mind blown by it. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, because especially at that time, like we were, uh, featured on like metal blogs and stuff like that. But that was, um, I guess our first foray into more mainstream access. 
I think I heard it on NPR the first time, which also surprised me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- it was huge for us. And I don't know, you know, I, this 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 could sound very out of touch um, because I, I, I don't have uh, as clear a picture of, of that time um, as maybe I do this one. But but it did feel maybe that it was a bit more rare or um, I, I, I think that mainstream outlets have done um a much better job at covering um metal and hardcore and punk and stuff like that uh yeah especially now in recent years yeah exactly um but at the time you know it was it was kind of this like weird you know only a few bands got to do it you know i remember like wolves in the throne room and baroness and couple of these kind of what i consider to be more like high arty uh metal bands were were kind of making the jump um right to to the sort of mainstream recognition so when i saw that we had kind of made that leap you know and that those types of places were picking us up i was like holy shit you know like we might we might be one of these bands because say especially baroness for example that was a band that we um, looked at and wanted to, in a way, mimic their trajectory. Yeah, because at the time, those were the bands you heard of. Code Orange, Baroness, Mastodon, and maybe one or two others that I'm forgetting. No, exactly right, yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Your mind must have been blown, right? I remember a ton of press. I remember a lot of love for the album. I remember people writing articles about it. It was just, uh, it must have been exciting. It was, it was really exciting, yeah. All right, moving on to... New Bermuda, your next LP. Now, I was reading about this, and uh, you had moved to LA, you were in a new relationship, and you were struggling with being in LA, and you know there were some struggles in the relationship, and a lot of that experience ended up going into the album, yes? Yeah, yeah, it's... Um... It's, it's, it, it's funny. It's, it's probably, <laughs> again, this kind of harkens back to what we were talking about earlier, but it's probably, um, in that way, kind of our most immature record lyrically, because I was just so, uh, overwhelmingly focused on myself and all of these, you know, all these habits that I'd kind of picked up as a teen and, and early twenties, you know, by the time I was, 26 um and deaf heaven had gained a certain amount of success and um we were not living uh on the floor for the first time you know i i uh i was able to get my own apartment and that sort of thing and uh so basically i just had a lot more money for um for for messing about and yeah that record you know, I think everyone in the band kind of feels like that record is is just a sort of dark spot in the band. Um, like I, I love those songs and and they're fun as hell to play live. And you know, I'm I'm happy we did it. But just in in our personal lives and how we were as people and you know everything going on, it was just sort of an ugly period. And while the lyrics definitely have a certain ugliness to them. It's not the ugliness that I'm talking about now, you know, and, and now, and now that, now that I can kind of reflect on them more, I think like, Oh, this is, it's, it's almost comical how, uh, how just sort of mad the whole thing is. (laughs) And, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's new Bermuda. A, A lot of, a lot of good, came out of that record too and Allison Sholnick did the cover and I just saw her new show in New York last year and you know it's a lot of what really good came came from making that record our, our relationship with anti etc but um yeah it's uh it's maybe our our problem child of of all of them well I love it it's funny like I I I was listening to it a lot during a bad period in my life. So I I listened to it again, like somewhat recently, because I thought you might be coming on the show, you know, and it just put me right back in 2015. And I was like, wow, I remember this year. Oh, no. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, God, I know. We 
like we, we have to vow now to never do Bermuda anniversary shows simply so we don't have to relive those horrid times. <laughs> well, the music is great. It's just uh, maybe life wasn't so great then. So uh, did you ever find any peace in L.A.? Like I, I read that, you know, you were having trouble getting out and connecting with people and it was weird be, you know, like you said, paying rent and having a car and being responsible for the first time. And I, I mean, did you, did you get set up there? Did you find happiness? I did. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, that was the year I became an adult, uh, you know, uh, really officially and, and so funny to, to have that be, um, to have that be such a, such a, a terrible time. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I did. I, I, and I did have those things with, with LA and, and again, this sounds kind of like old headish or something, but there was, there was at the time much less so now this kind of vague rivalry kind of cultural rivalry between the Bay Area and Southern California. There was a, a sort of, um, w- you know, when we were younger, we were kind of, you were kind of taught or you sort of learned that LA wasn't serious, you know, and that like the Bay Area had like realness to it, you know what I mean? And so I think when I came to LA, even though I had lots of friends there by that point and I loved being there and et cetera, et cetera, and I wasn't, actually from the Bay area either. Um, I had this kind of like, you know, like people here just don't get it. I don't, I can't explain to you why I felt that way. I just did. And so like why, while like a lot of people were connecting quite easily, you know, I, uh, I think just given my own, um, peculiar, you know, my own peculiarities, uh, was, was I not. And then, um, thankfully, uh, I got over that and, uh, and I found a really, really great, so many great groups of people there. Um, you know, uh, and LA today very much feels like home. Um, and, uh, yeah, all, all my, all my best friends are there. It's, uh, it, it's great, but yes, it, it did. There wasn't a, I guess an adjustment period. I get it because, uh, I'm from Philadelphia ori- originally and, you know, we're mad at everybody. So. <laughs> Moving to New York was an adjustment. And I still think that sometimes, like, oh, people in New York don't understand anything. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm yeah. from Philadelphia, where we l- live real lives. And you know what? I can tap into that anger anytime I want and separate <laughs> myself from people. And I do sometimes. But I find that if, if I just get over that and just take people at face value on a case-by-case basis, I'm much happier. Yes, that, you're, that is the way. <laughs> that is the way. Hard as, hard as it is sometimes, but that is the way. <laughs> so we can call you Grammy-nominated Deaf Heaven now. Yes, so they, yes. so they say. Yes, do you ever say that? Do you ever introduce yourself as, hey, I'm George from Grammy-nominated band Deaf Heaven? I do, I do. On every, on every imaginary grant application, that's that's the first thing that goes up. Yeah, if I was ever at some like industry dinner, I'd drop that like a brick <laughs> everywhere. Why not? Yeah, if it if it if it did anything materially for me, I would I'd wear it on my shirt, believe me. <laughs> so you got nominated for Ordinary Corrupt Human Love, yes? Yes. Yes, we did. Um yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Did you uh, did you actually go to the ceremony? We did. Yeah, uh, we went to the ceremony. It was great. Um, I took my mom, and we got to dress up, and we got to see after the ceremony. They have like a um, they have like the official party. You know, I think most people go to kind of their own private party, but uh, TLC played the official party. So we went and saw Uh-oh. TLC and that was, that's cool. It was great. They had like a, a really great live band. Um, weird Al was there. Yeah. It was fun. Wow. Did you get to meet weird Al? I didn't No, no. Uh, he, he was very popular, uh, at the time that I noticed him. <laughs> Did you get to meet any heavy hitters? No, no, not. Re- I'm trying to think, uh, no, no, I did. No, it's like I'm not like a great 
going up and meeting people. Like if someone were to introduce me, that would have been amazing. I stood next to um, a, a few cool people. Um, I stood next to N- Nipsey Hussle at one point. Oh, uh, nice. Rest in peace. Yeah, that was, I was like, oh my God, it's Nipsey. Um, actually, Carrie and I, we went and saw, we because you get like invited to these parties or whatever and whatever. It's just, just kind of like industry nothingness. But um, Dua Lipa, before she like really blew up, performed at one. And that was fun because you're like five feet away from her. Um, and then a year on, you're like, oh, wow, this is like a superstar. Uh, this this little stuff like that, but no, I, I wish I had a more like exciting story. Uh, we were just, just happy to be there. <laughs> no, I, I get it. I'm really awkward around people and I, I always feel like I'm bothering everybody. So it, I like, I've seen my own friends at fests and I like, I haven't seen them in a while and I'm like, ah, they're talking to someone. I shouldn't go say hi. I don't want to bother them. So I'm, I'm like, I'm, I don't know. I can be weird around people. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I uh, honestly, I'm, I'm mostly okay. I just feel like at those types of things, you're, uh, I expect, I, I'm expecting the other person to be thinking like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> like, like they see, uh, you know, their peripheral, like me walking up, like, who, what is this? <laughs> That's kind of like what I imagine. And have you ever like reached out and got shot down? Like there's been times where that happened to where I'm like, hey, I'm from so and so, or or hey, I'm going to be at this thing, and you just get nothing. So then I'm like, ah, oh, never mind. I'll never do that again. Ah, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I've I've never had a moment where I felt like totally cold shouldered, but um, and I won't say I won't say who, but but we've been in the like back in the day, you know, when we were much when we were problem children, um, at like a festival with like a cool band that we like you know, and that we want to like impress. And so we're like sitting at a table with this cool band and like someone breaks out, you know, like a mirror uh, <laughs> and the, yes. and the cool band is like, well, we cannot be with these guys. <laughs> uh, that happened like once or twice. Yeah. And then w- where I felt like, Oh shit, like, like really embarrassed, you know, like, Oh, I totally read the room wrong here. Yeah. Isn't it funny when you're young, like how you think that's going to go over big like, especially for a band that's cool or bigger. Like, and when I was young, I imagined like, oh, everybody parties hard like me. So if I bust out this and this, like, they're going to love it. But that that's usually not the case at all. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's exactly right. And it's funny, too. I, I, I have a, such respect, honestly, for younger bands. Bands that are that are young, that have older people or younger bands with younger people, because but both operate in the same way, which is much, much smarter than I did. Um, Cause you know, what, what, like the story in particular that I'm referring to, I'm like 23 at the time, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I did have that feeling. I was like, I was like, Oh, this is like, this is what people do here. You know, like yeah. if you walk in a room and you got like a bottle and a bag on you, you know, like you're the room's best friend uh, and just totally not the case. You know, in fact, those people are the people that are most that that most don't want to be near it. You know, is like, exactly that's and, why they're at they're at the level they're at. It's not like the '80s anymore and Guns yes. and Roses. Like real bands on that level have a manager keeping people like us away. <laughs> yes, exactly. But when you grow up, just like watching, you know, like DVDs of you know your favorite bands and stuff like that, it's you know, and you buy into the mythos and you buy into, to, you know, the culture and all that. Um, yeah, it, it, it can lead you to funny situations, <laughs> but, but like I said, young people, younger bands, I think maybe because of social media or, or what have you, I mean, probably largely due to that, um, are just much smarter and have a greater understanding and, and, uh, uh, of how things work and, and what the proper way to be is. And, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm impressed by young awesome bands like One Step Closer or Anxious. They're they're young. They're like 20, 21, 22 years old. They already seem like seasoned professionals. They're straight edge or mostly straight. I think they're all straight edge and they just they don't get into like all the troublemaking stuff that happened before and I'm always impressed by younger bands who do that. Yeah, I am too. And this is to say that, you know, I appreciate the hell out of a wild card. And actually most bands that we 
end up being really affectionate toward, um, I would consider kind of more like wild card types, or at least at one point were, you know? Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's space for both, but, but if, uh, if, if a band can, um, can sort of, uh, uh, mitigate, uh, a lot of the missteps that maybe someone like me took, um, I think that's positive. Yeah, definitely. So Def Heaven stunned the world again in 2021 with Infinite Granite, uh, myself included, because uh, I was not expecting the direction you went in totally. So so here's a thought. And now, again, I'm curious to get your perspective on this. I, uh, I often cite Def Heaven as like the perfect trajectory for a band. Now, I know you can't necessarily plan all these things out and things kind of happen and well, maybe some combination of the two, but check this out. So we have Sunbather, right? The explosive debut that introduces you to the world. And then we have New Bermuda, which in my opinion is like a refinement of Sunbather. It's tighter. It's more concise. It doesn't change direction too much. And it lets us know, it lets everybody know that we mean business. Then we move on to Ordinary Corrupt Human Love, which is still heavy, but we're introducing a lot more rock and different melodic elements, right? And this sets the stage to really do something different. And then we have Infinite Granite. So how much thought and discussion goes into it when you're moving into the next album cycle? And, or like, are you just writing... And that's what comes out next naturally, or is it both? Like, I'm interested to hear your perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah it's a, firstly, a, a great synopsis. I appreciate it. Uh, the yeah, when we when we write albums, they happen at the same time. Um, typically, what happens is the first thing that's written sounds very similar to our last record, um, and we kind of shake that off, and then the subsequent two to three songs will really determine where things are kind of going the like the skeleton. And, um, and then we'll usually have like a conversation. Uh, that's pretty like agreeable, you know, that, that everyone already knows is coming, but it's just good to verbalize it. Say like, uh, with new Bermuda, you know, it'd be like, you know, after like a couple of the songs written, you're like, man, hey, for this next song, we should just do like full dissection. Like, what do you think? You know, and then the room is like, great. Yeah, because that's what we're going for and blah, blah, blah. You know, and like, you're like, okay, cool. We're all on the same page here. Like, like, let's, let's, now that we have a couple of these songs written, let's make this a blackened death metal record, you know, at least our version of it, uh, because that's what we're all feeling. And so that's kind of, that's sort of the MO now. And, and, you know, we're not always going to draw inside the lines, but generally that's kind of kind of the mode. Um, and with Infinite Granite, uh, we had written um, Lament for Wasps, which to me is uh, the most sort of ordinary like song. It was our first it was the first song written. And then we wrote Villain. And then I think we, I th want to say that we wrote Shell Star, uh, the, the opening song is like track three. So by the time that happens, now it's like, okay, this is very clearly going in a different, in a direction that I don't know if harsh vocals are going to complement this because that's ultimately the biggest question for this record, right? Is like, what will the vocal sound like? And if we had said early on, no, we're going to keep the black metal stuff or, or the, or however you want to call what I do, the, the, the shrieking, if we're going to keep that largely, I'm sure that the songs probably would have developed in a different way. But after those first couple songs, we were like, you know, um, you know, let's, let's have an honest conversation. This is what I've been listening to. This is why these things are coming out this way. None of us are saying no to this. This is ticking a box that we haven't ticked before. And I'm finding that our songwriting is growing in ways I didn't imagine that they would, you know, all these kind of things. So 
so what are we going to do here? You know, clearly we know that making a decision this dramatic is going to uh, ruffle feathers. It's going to, you know, I mean, even thinking about like in practical matters, like this could hurt sales, this could diminish tours, this could, you know, like you've just been nominated for a Grammy making this type of music and now you're going to do this. Right. Um, and those things are all get talked about. Um, and then what ultimately gets said is like, what are we here for? You know, Deaf Heaven's always been a reflection of where we're at at this time in our lives. And, and like, honestly, if we had done some Baylor part two, three and four, you know, we'd, you know, we might be in, you know, 3000 cap rooms or something, you know, if we had just kind of built this idea, but instead, you know, we, we were people that kind of pursue the heart um for for better or worse and um and that's what this was uh this was like this is clearly what we want to do uh we're going to make the decision to do it uh i'm going to sing um and we are going to expand our sound in a different way and and see what happens yeah it stoked my interest in the band even more because i remember hearing great massive color for the first time and i was like wow Wow, they've done it again. Great. So was it difficult? Did you have to refine your voice for the cleaner vocals? Did you have to work on that a lot? A ton. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll I'll even say in the recording and even the tour after, um still not in the position where I really wanted it to be, where it is now. Um, where I feel very equal I feel equally confident singing as i as i do screaming so yes the the learning curve was was quite a bit for me not only in terms of of singing but in, in writing i mean uh you know the challenge was to write choruses you know which we had really never done and and so like this is our first this is literally like our first time writing choruses and like we want them to be catchy and we want to you know we want things to hit and all this kind of things. And it's a totally, totally different way of, um, of arranging songs and, 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 uh, and deciding on, on what things to like really focus on, you know, not like just speed and heft, uh, which is, which is largely, you know, what we've done in the past. Right. No, I've read about, uh, just all the work that went into the record and a, a lot of new things being experimented with and, demoed and worked on and you can really hear the effort throughout in the record and uh you took a more direct lyrical approach with this one right like uh you know when i write i tend to mask everything in allegory and symbolism because that's safe and you know it makes it seem more mysterious but whenever i write more direct that's always uh, more difficult i find the same um and I, I did want to make a point, you know, Deaf Heaven's lyrics have often either been directly abstract or are so personal that to a reader, they could only appear abstracted, you know, like these terms and things that I'm putting together really are only intended to make sense to me. Yeah. And when I reflected on that in our earlier records, especially Sunbather, um, because like, God bless them, but you know, these kids, you know, they will get these things tattooed on them and stuff sometimes. And, and so I was like, you know, I really gotta be more like, I gotta like really make sure that, that, you know, this is that I'm being clear about my intent here and that there's, that this isn't convoluted. And I've, and I, and I really, I looked at a lot of my old lyrics as being quite convoluted and, and, um, and so, yes, Infinite was an exercise in ironing out ideas, trying to simplify them. Again, trying to create hooks and take my type of lyricism and, and make it into choruses and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, it was just a, a, lot of, 
lot of songwriting exercise. You know, I, I, I want to say also in regards to that record, it really couldn't have been done at any other point, truthfully, uh, which I think was another reason for its pursuit. We, we, in 2020, you know, we had time and we just had time and, right. and we had EDD, you know, or the, the, you know, the government assistance. Which, which which was was huge for us, you know what I mean? Like we weren't, you know, we weren't necessarily um, worried about, you know, the road and all that. So when we, so when we, so when we canceled our year of touring, which initially was quite devastating, um, you know, we we used what was given to us as an opportunity to focus and make something that we honestly couldn't have made with the usual amount of time that we're given to make records. Mm. Um, so I'm glad, you know, like however, whatever new thing we work on or however infinite ends up sitting in, in, in our, in our discography, ultimately, um, I think it's really cool that, that it was made and that we, that all these kind of, out of such a rough situation, all these stars aligned so that we were able to have the patience um, to make it. That's great. Yeah, I, everything is supposed to happen when it's supposed to happen, if it's supposed to happen, right? Because I'm always thinking I should be doing this, I should be doing that. Uh, I I never got to this thing that I said I was going to do, but I find that if you just let time go by and you stay focused and you're doing what you got to do, like. Things happen when they're supposed to happen. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I find, I find the same. Did you ever feel pressure to try cleaner vocals earlier, like maybe on Ordinary Corrupt or on any of the earlier records, or was it like you said, where the guys are like, "No, this is the structure of what it's going to be," so you know what you're going to do? Yeah, no, I, I never, um, no, I, I never wanted to to sing on on older stuff. There, there we there's like clean vocal accents um we did a single from the kettle under the coil at like the very end there's like a clean accent on ordinary there's uh chris and shiv do backup vocals there's also the song near where like everyone sings but even on that track which we all just stood together with like a microphone singing it um i'm like the least present in fact, I think I think I'm like physically standing back the furthest. Um, <laughs> just very uh, nervous, you know, and and yeah. Um, yeah, and and being like this, you know, this isn't what I do, you know, uh, and kind of unnecessarily boxing myself in for whatever reason. No, again, I think you did everything the perfect way and over the perfect amount of time. Because when I was young and just getting into this music, the I don't want to say trend, but a lot of what was happening at the time was like heavier bands going lighter. So as soon as a band got some buzz, you know, they would abandon the heavier sound and go for a lighter sound. And as a 16, 17, 18 year old, this, that really hurt me because I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm being abandoned by this band that I love. And, you know, as I got older and more perspective, I respect everybody's decision. And I like all the music, but, you know, I think. Again, just perfect trajectory. So kudos for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have the Sunbather 10th anniversary. This is remixed, remastered, yes? Yes. And I'm excited to hear that, to see what happened with it. Are we are we happy with the end result? It sounds great. Yeah. Um, it's It sounds awesome. You know, it, I was saying earlier with the lyricism and the kind of when we were doing Rose to Judah, um, and really all of our early stuff, there's, you know, this such a heavier black metal focus. And, uh, and so given that aesthetic, I think the original recordings are, um, quite thin, uh, comparatively, especially, uh, and, um, and yeah, just in an effort to modernize it and give it the weight that I think it actually deserves. Um, we uh we gave it this little remix. It it gets the job done. I like that. I'm excited to hear that. And uh so that comes out uh is it November seventeenth on Death Wish? Yes. Yes. So everybody listening, 
We have to pick that up. It's a classic. I mean, come on. What are we doing? You know, why why have one when you could have two also? Exactly. <laughs> one is not enough. Two is not too many. Let's go. I love it. Uh, oh, and you said you're working on the next record, yes? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we we are back at it. It's been uh, it's been very exciting. I I love this part. Now, do we know what it's going to be? Do we have the skeleton? We have some skeletons, uh, and we've we've had our conversation. <laughs> mm. Yes. Imagine if you dropped like a funk metal album and just surprised the hell out of everybody. You know, we got to do something. We got to we got to keep people on their toes. Our fans will never get consistency. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're doing everything correctly, so keep it up. And uh is there is there any uh, tours coming up that we want to announce, any shows, anything that we want to make the people aware of? Uh, there's not actually. We're we're doing these sunbather shows, um, which I'm very excited about. Our friends Touche and Moray will be joining us. Um, we those have been some of our best friends for a long time now, so very excited they could do it. Uh, and next year we actually have completely clear right now um, because we're gonna do the other side of things. What's the other side of things? Recording. Recording. Yeah, yeah. I gotta. Got to make the the next thing. A whole year clear. That that just sent a tingle down my spine. I love the sound of that, but in reality, I would end up hating it because I wouldn't have anything to do. But you'll you'll be busy working on the record the whole year, probably, right? Yeah, or at least some of it. I mean, you know, to be honest with you, I, I won't be surprised if um we we get busy in the in the summer and fall. It would, no one really likes to sit at home for too long. But uh, as it stands, nothing planned. It does feel good. Uh, considering how busy this year was, I'm, um, I'm looking forward to some home time. What do you do in your downtime? Uh, I, I, uh, I, I guess I work, (laughs) (laughs) I guess I'm working on this album. Um, no, that's actually literally what I've been doing this week. Uh, but it's like a, it's kind of like you're saying, it's like, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a, it's a privilege, you know, that, um, that, uh, that I get to, um, spend my brain uh creatively and and um yeah so so mostly that and then and then some holidays excellent excellent well george you know i've been listening to the band for well over 10 years now and uh, i love everything that you guys have done and are doing and uh i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. And there you have it. George Clark. Wow. Excellent, excellent conversation. I've been dreaming of having Deaf Heaven on the show for years, and it finally happened. Perfect timing for this episode, too. And what a great conversation it was. George was super forthcoming. You know, I really liked the deep dive into each of the records and just hearing about their whole creative process and their trajectory, which has been amazing and everything. You know, I live for those moments when you just get hit by a record so hard and it takes over everything and you know, you listen to a song or the, you listen to a song on the record or you listen to the record 5,000 times in a row. And I definitely did that with Sunbather for all of 2013. So just really happy to talk to George. So thank you so much, George, for coming on the show. Excellent, excellent stuff. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? There's a lot to cover in the end of the show here. First of all, I just got back from the quicksand slip retrospective event they had at Generation Records in New York City. And it was really great. Uh, Walter himself was there. He talked a lot about uh, New York hardcore and coming up and everything that influenced Quicksand and Slip and the release of the record. Norman Brandon was there from Antimatter and Texas is the Reason and many other things. He was providing a lot of uh, excellent commentary as well. We had Melinda Beck, who did the artwork for Slip, and maybe Manic Compression too, I think. I forget. And then uh, John Marcus, he took the legendary picture of Walter, the one where he's kind of 
bent over with the guitar and he has the long hair. And that was a really interesting story. And of course, Casey from Iodine Recordings, who talked about uh, the re-release and getting the rights from Universal and working with Quicksand together to put together the vision for the record and the book and everything. Uh, It was just really great stuff. Really great stuff. It was hard to stand there for two hours. I was just standing there for two hours and listening to people. Now, it was interesting and compelling stuff, but I'm super ADD and I'm not used to standing up that long. So I was like leaning against the record bins and my mind was wandering at points, but I stayed focused. I got through it. I stood up for two whole hours. That's a record for me. So that was really great. After that, I went out to eat with Casey and some other people. And then I came home to finish recording the podcast because I'm so dedicated to my craft. I just have to. I have to put this together for you for Monday morning. Oh, and I did get a chance to say hi to Norman in person. That was great. Oh, I met uh, Sonny from Hate56. He filmed the whole event, and that's going to be up on his site. So check it out once he posts that, because it, it, it was like a live podcast almost, focused on quicksand and slip. There was so much interesting stuff that was talked about, like stuff I didn't even know about, about the artwork and the pictures, and and it was all really interesting. So really nice to meet Sonny. Check out the video on Hate56 when he posts it. It's really good stuff. So I'm home, and in an unprecedented move, I will be going back out tonight, Sunday, on a Sunday night. Can you believe it? Because Quicksand is playing the Slip Anniversary show at Webster Hall. So I'm going to go back into Manhattan and watch the show because I I just had too much fear of missing out. I can't miss it. And I haven't seen Quicksand with Brodsky on guitar, and I really want to see that. And come on, playing Slip in full, that's just, that's just too good. I have to be there. And I, I have made a commitment to go out more and go to more shows and just listen to a lot more music in general. Instead of just sitting here and working all the time and with Twitch on in the background, because you know I just need to be more immersed in music like I was before the pandemic, and I am committed to getting back there. So it looks like I'm on on the right path. It's happening. So lots of exciting stuff happening today. Uh, Really awesome day so far. And uh, this is episode 200 of the podcast, and I'm super excited about that. Still surprised we made it this far. Pleasantly surprised. Still surprised with the trajectory of the show and everything that's happened, and I'm just really happy about it. You know, I still remember when we hit 100 episodes. That was special. We had Grady Allen from Anxious on the show. Anxious had just, Little Greenhouse was just coming out and I was super stoked on that record. And I was really excited that we were able to book Grady and, uh, you know, we got him on the show. It was a really great conversation. 100 episodes. It was all very exciting stuff. And it's all very exciting for this one as well, because uh, Deaf Heaven, come on. That's huge. I've been waiting years to have them on the show. And I was thinking about the show, you know, just uh, there's been a lot of different versions of the show. We had the Northeast scene. We had Tommy here for the first 111 episodes of the show. And then he left and I was shaken to my core when he left because I was not prepared to do this show by myself. And you know what? I completely burned myself out in 2022 when he left. And you know what I realized? When Tommy left, I had a... He left in March of 2022, right? Every episode until like September, I had a guest co-host, or most of them at least. And no wonder I burnt myself out because that's crazy. Like, because the interview is enough work, right? The interviews are long and you have to edit that. And then when I have a guest co-host, there's a whole front segment and back segment to edit, which is a whole nother interview in itself. So that was a ton of labor to put together all those shows leading up to September. So not surprising that I burnt myself out, but listen, I've got it down now. I'm comfortable. Everything's good. I think the show is better than it's ever been. So here's to the next 200 episodes. We're going to do it. There's a lot of big stuff on the horizon. There's some very big guests I'm working on. I hope they happen this year. If they don't happen this year, I'm sure it's going to happen next year. So let's move into the 
New Scene Community Hour. How about that? We've got some new reviews. Okay, we've got a new review from DZIMINGD. Five stars. Very glad this exists. As someone who also grew up in the Philly area scene, it's refreshing to find a podcast with guests in the world of hardcore and punk. Thank you so much for that review. And listen, I'm reminding you again, we need a lot of Apple podcast reviews. So open up the podcast app if you have an iPhone, hit the five star button, write a review if you want. You don't have to write a review. I would like you to if you want to, but just hit the five star button. It'll help me out. Even do it on like your friend's phones and stuff like that. We've got to hit 200. We have to. Oh, I wonder if that's the review from, uh, I met this nice guy at the Quicksand Slip event. He was wearing, I forget your name, I'm sorry. He was wearing a On the Might of Princes hoodie. Really nice guy, recognized me from the show. We talked for a second. Shout out to you. He said he left a review on Apple Podcasts, and I was really happy about that. So nice to meet you. Thank you. I met a couple people uh, who listen to the podcast or are aware of it. So that was really cool. That was really cool. And listen, I'm going to do some thanks here for this massive 200 episodes of the show. Okay, first, I would like to thank my co-host, Tommy, who started the show with me. I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself. I wouldn't have been able to do it if he hadn't done it with me. Tommy came back for episode 133 with Jesse from Stick to Your Guns. That was the first time he came back after leaving. And he came back again for the Stephen Brodsky episode. That was episode 187. So check those out if you're interested in hearing Tommy. Uh, Thanks to all of our sponsors this year. Thanks to Monica at Speakeasy PR. Thanks to Amy and Tim over at Adam Splitter PR. Thanks to the other Tim at Sweet Cheetah PR. Thanks to Rich and Trey and Christine and Jake over at Death Wish Inc. Thanks to Simon Trip Coney for our graphics. Thanks to Brian Morgante of Flesh and Bone Design for one of our shirt designs. And all of the photographers we work with on a regular basis, Sean Riley. Danielle Dombrowski, Nathaniel Shannon, Corey Lane, Corey Davenport, Adam Gerhold, and Michelle Minona, who I saw at the event today, the quicksand event with Walter and Norman and Casey. I was talking to her for a while. Shout out to you, Michelle. Good to see you. And uh, last but certainly not least, I thank Casey and Joe at Iodine Recordings because none of this would be possible without them. And Casey and Joe's continued support and you know all of the guidance Casey has given me on this show and everything he's done is uh it still surprises me it still surprises me he is really dedicated to the craft and I've learned a lot and uh, he's been a good friend and mentor so thank you Casey and thank you Joe great stuff great stuff I'm really happy with the show I'm really happy with the way things are going I'm really happy about everything in general. Oh, and uh, here's some more stuff for the New Scene Community Hour. We got a comment from Zen Spirit on Spotify. He said, great, exclamation point, exclamation point. That's two exclamation points for the Jeff Caudill episode. That's number 198, Jeff from Game Face and Low Coast. And uh, Dave, Dave said, love the show. Been listening for a long while now. Keep up the great work. You have the best guests in the game. And he said that about Jeff Howe, episode 199. Jeff Howe from Horsewhip. I wonder if that's Dave from Horsewhip. Well, listen, whether it is or not, thank you, Dave. I appreciate you. And Rob L. said, oh, this is, uh, this is in reference to the Dan Yemen episode. Rob L. said, what was his influence for Kid Dynamite? It cut off. Love the show, by the way. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, I made a mistake in the Dan Yemen episode. I cut it off when he listed his influences for Kid Dynamite, and he said the first Bad Brains record and the first Circle Jerks record. I fixed that audio. It's uploaded back up. It's good to go. Oh, and last but not least, okay, I got an email from John DiGiorgio. Now, if you don't know John, he was the drummer in Converge for the Poacher Diaries record. Now, when I had Kurt on the show, I asked him whatever happened to John, because I remember seeing Converge at that time, and John was new to the band, and I remember myself and some of my other friends were very impressed with him and his drumming, and we just ate up Poacher Diaries. We loved it. So John John himself wrote to me. 
And he said, uh, I had missed the Kurt Ballou interview until now. I wasn't expecting to hear a question about me, but it was delightful to hear Kurt describe that miserable Euro tour. It was 30 shows and 31 nights and was really intense. I was going through a weird and confusing period of my life and really didn't know what I wanted. I have no bad feelings towards anyone in the band. And now that the dust has long settled, I look back fondly on so much of that stuff. Thanks so much for your kind words about my playing on the Poacher Diaries. It really felt great to hear that. So that was really cool. I was talking to John uh, a lot on Instagram while I was uh, away on tour. You know, it was really cool to hear from him because those those Converge shows I saw that John played are some of my all-time favorite Converge shows. Uh, they were just on fire. Poacher Diaries is still one of my favorite releases, and Converge was playing a career-spanning set at that time. Their, their whole career at that time, they were playing stuff from Caring and Killing, Petitioning the Empty Sky, When Forever Comes Crashing, and The Poacher Diaries. You know, well, everything they had that I knew at that time. They, I don't think they were playing any really old stuff, but those four releases were the main ones, and they were playing stuff from all of it. And I saw them twice around that time, and it was unbelievably good. So uh, shout out to you, John. Good to hear from you. Oh, yeah, and John is in a new band called Mean Jesus. Check them out. Uh, they're, they're working on some new music right now, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. I think it's pretty good. That's what I hear. It's going to be pretty good. Hmm? Hmm? All right. So that's it. That's everything I've got. But uh, once again, I just want to thank everybody for your continued support. It's great meeting everybody. It's great hearing from everybody. Thank you for listening. Keep listening. And uh, that's it. I'm here every week with new episodes. So here's our music recommendation for this week. Taking Meds. Have you heard Taking Meds yet? They just put out a record called Dial M for Meds. It came out September of this year on Smart Punk Records. I caught them live on their tour with Casket Lottery, which I think was February of this year. And I remember watching them. I remember really liking them. And I remember the singer saying that they were going to be recording a record with Kurt Ballou or that they already had. I don't know. But Kurt recorded the record and it's great. It's one of my top records of this year. So we are going to end the show with Life Support by Taking Meds. I'll add that to the New Scene 2023 Spotify playlist. Make sure you check that out. I add all of our guests and all of my recommendations. You can follow it and hear all of the music from the show. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm back next week with another brand new and super awesome guest. The hits don't stop here at the New Scene. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next week.